almost 11,000 Southern troops would slam onto this side of Columbia Pike. This area of the U.S. line is defended by barely 4,500 men, almost two and a half to one odds, and still the Southern troops could not penetrate a significant section of this portion of the U.S. line. In fact, if you look at the casualties, to understand the importance of this side of the battlefield, nearly two-thirds of the southern casualties occur east of Columbia Pike. Remember, Carter House is west of the road. Two-thirds of the southern troops killed, wounded, or captured in this battle fall on this side of Columbia Pike. That's why this ground is so crucially important. That's why Collins Farm is so important. That's why the eastern flank is so important. You cannot go to Gettysburg and stand at the base of Robert E. Lee's statue as you move across that mile of open expanse toward where the U.S. line was and get any sense of Pickett's charge unless you can cover the entire section of ground or close to it. You cannot understand Franklin without this sort of hop, skip, and a jump because we can't get everything, but you can begin to see the path of the Southern advance through here. This ground and Collins Farm are hell on earth because while the southern troops are already taking artillery fire at up to 6,000 feet, as they're passing Carnton, they're taking the first of the solid shot, explosive shells. Because on this side of the battlefield, the artillery power was unbelievable on the federal side. I've written about this battle, but seeing and reading about what the federal gunners threw into the southern troops is almost stupefying at times. Just behind the left flank of the U.S. Army were 10 guns, and I cannot stress enough how important these 10 guns are to what happens on this side of the battlefield. Those 10 guns sit not far back behind where that White House is. Those 10 guns are three-inch ordnance rifles and 12-pound Napoleons, and one of the batteries was commanded by 4th United States regulars. These are regular army guys, not volunteers. They had been serving before the Civil War and they knew exactly what they were doing. Those 10 guns in just four hours of firing unleashed over 1,100 rounds into the Southern troops. By the time they hit this area of the battlefield, the Confederates, the ground is already strewn with casualties all the way back to Carnton. But now it's in increasing numbers. And the wounded, of course, are being hauled from this property, from Collins Farm, from back where Huskies is, back toward Carnton. But the survivors continue to push forward, and it's just a bull rush at the end. Because at this range, someone said, what, about 200 yards from the U.S. line, right back there? You're within rifle range. So now they're taking small arms fire. And the artillerymen back here have now switched over to canister. So this area is being sprayed repeatedly with shotgun blasts, those little round iron balls zipping through the air at about 1,700 feet a second. You get hit with one of those, you probably don't even feel it if it hits you in the right spot in the chest. It tears right through you. It can take off a part of your arm or part of your leg. In addition to those 10 guns, there are also two pieces of artillery from the 6th Ohio sitting right on Lewisburg Pike, two 12-pound Napoleons. They're also throwing canisters, so now you've got 12 pieces of artillery. And then you have to throw in the guns from Fort Granger, three-inch rifled guns across the river, easily striking this area, Collins Farm, down into the subdivision uh, that you drive through to head up to Carnton. So you have at least 16 pieces of artillery firing nonstop, you have almost 4,000 U.S. troops just from the gin to the river throwing everything they can. And remember, these guys are behind earthworks. The 124th Indiana, the Jack Casement's brigade. Casement, by the way, was an engineer after the war. He was there in Utah when they drove the Golden Spike on the Transcontinental Railroad and his men whipped the living tar of the southern troops here that day. Some of his guys had Henry rifles. The 124th Indiana, right back there. If I remember correctly, in the entire battle, that regiment had three casualties. 
three. Loring's men alone, 3,500, almost 1,000 killed and wounded. Walthall loses almost 800. French loses virtually 40% of his division, which is uh, his uh, uh, division, which is only two brigades. One of his brigades, Francis Marion Cockrell's Missourians, would go into this battle with 696 men. They would lose 62% by the time this battle was over. Cockrell's guys have been everywhere. Wilson's Creek, Pea Ridge, Iuka, Corinth, Vicksburg, all the way through the Atlanta campaign. Cockrell would be wounded four times. Cockrell had almost been killed during one of those mine explosions at Vicksburg, threw him about 100 feet in the air. When he came down, he broke his arm. He barely survived this battle. Cockrell's guys occupy an interesting spot on the field. Because if you notice here where French is, notice where Cockrell is. He's in reserve. Another very interesting facet of this ground, because everything becomes so constricted over here because of the sharp turn of the Harpeth River. Cockrell's men, as they're advancing, as the reserve unit of French's division behind Claudius Sears's brigade, what's right back there? Anyone know? What federal troops are back there? Remember, the main federal line's over here. What's back there? Wagner. Wagner. He has a brigade on this side of the road and a brigade on that side of the road, which allows the breakthrough in the middle to occur because Claiborne and Brown's men get right in behind Wagner's guys, using them almost as a shield. The far left of the brigade on this side of the road, which is Joseph Conrad's outfit, the left flank of that unit, in my opinion, just applying the size of the unit and, and how I know they were stretched out, extend almost to Adam Street. That's the street right up here. What happens is Sears tangles up in the far left flank of this brigade. Claiborne has been slowed. Brown has been slowed. Stewart's Corps is pouring through this area, lurching ahead of the rest of the southern attack. Stewart's men are actually swinging now ahead because there's a delay, because this advanced line doesn't just turn tail and run. They put up one hell of a fight for about five, six, seven minutes. That's an eternity in this battle. So Stewart's men begin swinging up this way. Loring and Walthall are pushing into each other. There's a little seam right here. And what Cockrell does as Sears is becoming engaged, Cockrell swings right around. It is my belief Cockrell comes right across the far edge of this property, right up where that playground is, and he begins pushing through this little seam. And the ground is pretty level once you come off that ridge. And what's he aiming for? Right at the gin. He is headed straight that way. I think Cockrell is actually the first Confederate unit to hit the line, and he came right across part of this property. But because he hit the line almost isolated, that's why his brigade of the 18 Confederate brigades suffered higher casualties than any. His men were absolutely eviscerated because the first volleys from the Federal line just tear Cockrell to pieces. You can even see on this map, which you might guess I helped create, that's why Cockrell's at this sort of cockeyed angle because he comes in through this seam and his right flank, he's just getting raked. Meanwhile, over here, you have elements of Scott's brigade close up to the river, uh, Featherston's men moving in behind Scott. But let's talk a little bit about this property, and then we're going to walk. And I'm not going to talk. <laughs> because what I want you to do is walk the ground. And not backwards or at an angle they didn't move. But walk it in the same direction they did. If you want to run, you can run. <laughs> but walk it. And think if you have the discipline or the bravery to push in that direction. When you have artillery fire coming in on your right, artillery fire coming in further on your right, sheets of musketry, and you have already lost significant numbers of your comrades, already left behind being hauled to the rear. It is a wonder, even for me, how the Southern troops were able to push through this storm. And even though Stewart's men were unable to break 
any portion of this line, the fact that they flung themselves up there in wave after wave after wave, because you might have heard the Confederates charge 12 or 13 different times. The Army does not charge, go back, charge again, go back. It's not that. What's happening is because there's this bottleneck and you have six divisions and 18 brigades and 100 different regiments, what's happening? You've got overlapping. So what the federal troops are describing are not individual attacks by the army, they're individual units. They're getting hit like a boxer does. They just go one, two, and another unit, and another unit, and they just come in piling in one after the other, after the other, after the other. This ground is traversed first by quarrels and shelly, elements, well, as well as cockerel. Quarles and Shelley of Walthall's division. Edward Walthall's a veteran. Edward Walthall said this was the worst field he ever experienced. He said he never saw his men take such destructive fire as they did at Franklin. But coming right in behind, you have perhaps some elements, especially Featherston coming over Collins Farm, traipsing over the tracks, coming across that side of the property. But here's what I want you to consider as we walk this way and so you can get some perspective on get a little closer to the main line and I can point out where the gin is and where General John Adams fell. If this ground, if you were to, at least for me, if you were to focus in on one really, really crucial event beyond the blistering artillery fire, which I think is, is so important to understand the Battle of Franklin, is to understand John Adams. Because Adams is one of the six Confederate generals who would fall here. His death was seen by countless men. Unlike Claiborne and Strahl and Granberry and Carter and Gist, who for the most part just sort of vanished into the smoke and there might have been one account or two, with Adams there were a multitude of accounts. Adams is a West Pointer. He was classmates, actually roommates, with George Pickett. Life has a strange, twisted way of playing jokes on you, doesn't it? These two men taking part at some point in their career in a Confederate army, having been trained as U.S. soldiers, leading two of the most famous frontal assaults ever made in the Civil War. Classmates at West Point. Breveted for gallantry in Mexico, married, his six children, his youngest daughter is 13 months old. He's hit in the shoulder early in the action, shakes off the wound, continues to move forward with his men. Adams, as a veteran, and you probably didn't even need to be a veteran, what he sees over there on Collins Farm property, down here on the other side of Lewisburg Pike, in what is this Thompson Alley area, as Scott's men and Featherston's men are just being torn apart. Some of Featherston's men are actually trying to crawl up the railroad tracks on their hands and knees. Because see, the left flank of the U.S. Army doesn't butt up against the river because as Sam mentioned, there's a railroad cut through here. It's a pretty steep embankment. You've got the river, the tracks, and then the left flank. So Featherston's guys get this crafty idea that if they can get up the tracks, they can get around the flank. That didn't work out too well, because one of the battery commanders rolled two of his guns over to the edge of the railroad cut and started firing lengthwise down the tracks, blowing Featherston's men back in every conceivable fashion. Adams, trailing 200 to 250 yards behind the frontline units, as a reserve unit would standardly do, he can see this. He sees the two frontline brigades of his commander's division being ground into a pulp. We don't know what went through Adams' mind. We never will. But his actions would seem to indicate that it was one of those moments in battle where soldiers just make a decision and they just go with it. Because there's not a lot of time to weigh the options. Shall I do this or should I do this? Should we form a committee and talk about it? No. You just do it. <coughs> because you don't have any time. And so what Adams does is he begins veering west. 
probably down in here. I have never believed for a moment that John Adams' men ever went over Collins Farm like the marker says. That's just me. They come through here. They come plowing right through here. Now, maybe they're over a little part of Collins Farm. See, I like to be controversial. I'll tell you exactly what I mean. I think they came through here. Because where he hits, I don't know that you can, he'd have to almost pull a left angle through, moving through Collins Farm. He's simply veering down here as he sees this chaos and he comes plowing right through here. He comes right across these railroad tracks. He has the biggest brigade in Loring's division. He's got 1,500 Mississippi. And they go plowing right through this terrain and he is headed toward where the chaos is at. Whether he could see what was happening up there, don't know. But I assure you, he could hear it. And from where his unit was coming from, it is very likely he could see Wagner's men on that ridge begin running to the rear. Instinct kicks in. You realize now you've got a chance, now you follow it up, and now you go. And so he sees this, he sees that, and he takes his men right that way. Because even if you can't see what's happening up there, you can hear it. You can feel it. You can hear the explosion in the middle. Something has happened. Those guys running back, Claiborne's men right in behind him, and all of a sudden, all oh, holy hell has just erupted. You can hear it. You know something is occurring, and Adams is headed this way. The breakthrough extends to the gym. What's he trying to do? I believe he's trying to further exploit the breach. He is trying to punch this hole wider to the east. And you don't want to go right in on the edge of the breach. You want to get a little bit further over. So if you can break it there, you just fold that whole piece up. And he goes right at the colors of the 65th Illinois. They're the target. Problem for Adams is they have Henry's. Several men in that unit said they could never forget their commanding officer, Scott Stewart, screaming at the men. Don't shoot that man. Don't shoot that rider. Because I believe that what Adams does from the accounts of two men in that unit who described a lone rider on a white horse emerging from the smoke, and we know Adams' horse was white, emerging from the smoke, as we get over here, you'll see the low ground cuts right through there. That's where the 65th is. And as they talk about him emerging from the smoke, he's coming out of that low area where the smoke has begun to settle down, and he's making that final push up toward the federal line. He almost got on top of the earthworks. He would vault the horse up in an effort to break the line, and at that last moment, the color bearer shot him down. And I would suspect he probably took about 9 or 10 or 11 bullets right here. When they aimed, they didn't miss because he was almost on top of them. And the Confederate effort just washes up on the line. Thousands of these men would spend that night trapped at the base of these earthworks. Some would begin to retire. The wounded are continuing to be hauled out to Carnton because that night there was only one real field hospital in Franklin, and that was here. Although within 24 to 48 to 72 hours, the entire town would become a hospital. It was a night of misery. These artillerymen, and this is the brutal part of war, the Confederate attack on this side of the field, remember, Stuart's men had sort of lurched forward. The battle ends here first. They were so decimated. The Southern troops who punched through the middle stubbornly hung on to sections of line they had taken in close proximity there at the Carter House as they brawled it out for hours. This side of the battlefield, it's mostly over by 6 or 6.30. In fact, there were federal troops who moved a skirmish line out into this area by 7 o'clock. <coughs> federal skirmishers would find General Adams' body outside the earthworks. Skirmishers from Casement's Brigade. Meanwhile, the artillerymen back there kept firing. Anything that moves, shoot it down. They kept spraying this area with canister until 8 o'clock. Any movement, any movement, open up on it. So as we walk this ground, whether it's Quarles, Shelley, elements of Featherston, 
but in particular Adams. Think about what's running through their mind as those last seconds are unfolding. And you know you may not get out of it, but you're trying to achieve an objective. The orders have been given. These men were soldiers indeed. So just walk the ground. We are probably, I think what we'll do is stop right where those two trees are with sort of the, where the leaves are coming out underneath. Just stop right, everybody understand we're on straight ahead. We'll stop there, but just take your time. Just walk the ground and think about what these men were going through on, uh, on this particular portion of the battlefield. And then I think I can answer some questions over there if anyone has any.